the model is not strictly correct. Livingstone believes that the wreck site holds clues to how the bow arrived in its final position. On the starboard side, there is this big wave, almost a bow wave of silt, where the ship was pushing in. And there is, uh, uh, and the anchor is, uh, at the bottom of the anchor is just about on the silt. I see. Another clue to the bow's impact is found on the port side. Over, over the top of the bridge. And to Livingstone's down, surprise, down there's a giant bend in the hull. At the big radius bend. The bend on the port side in the hull, um, it certainly took me by surprise. The condition uh, of the hull in that area where it had bent round, uh, right round 180 degrees in a radius of uh, perhaps about three meters. And the hull hadn't fractured. Uh, the, the plates were intact. What uh, uh, could have happened, Bill, was that the ship was sinking nose down. Nose down. But going sideways, sideways at the same time. And then buried itself in, into the silt. Just with the momentum of the steel and all the entrained water in it, just wanted to keep going. Yes. And squashed up. Right, that sounds it plausible. Just, it, it, it just actually concertinaed and, and made this big buckle. Yes. That is, I think, just about there. Understanding how the stern arrived on the bottom is a bit more puzzling. It was number four, which we had placed in you know, two days earlier. The stern wreckage is chaotic. This, too, is an important clue. Um, Livingstone and Garski think that after the bow pulls the stern underwater, the bow and stern separate. The incredible pressure on air trapped inside the stern causes inward implosions. Yeah, uh, this is the center to screen. Livingstone's trained eyes, Titanic's propellers provide clues as to how the stern finally landed on the bottom. The propellers are curiously bent upwards, which suggests that the aft end of the stern hit the bottom first. And it would almost look as if the aft end hit the bottom, uh, just dropping like a stone. very hard mud and then would have stopped in a rather short time and that would cause classic shock damage. Anything that was not well attached would break loose. It took some 15,000 people two years to build Titanic. She was made with more than 25,000 tons of steel and her engines produced nearly 50,000 horsepower. But the forces of nature simply tore the greatest ship of her day to pieces in a matter of minutes and spread them out across the ocean floor. Surprisingly, the scattered pieces are not fully mapped. Their final location will now be recorded for history. Over the past several days, the crew of Nadir has been busy modifying Natil. The submersible is outfitted with another of Paul Mathias' sonar devices. Mathias will attempt a first. Using new software technology, he will try to create the first archaeological map of the entire wreck site, which is almost one square mile. Well, the Titanic is a huge ship. It's bigger than anything we've ever imaged. 
It's one giant uh, behemoth on the ocean floor. There has never been a routine detailed survey of the Titanic. Preparation for this investigation began half a world away in the warm, shallow waters off the coast of Greece. Matthias was here to fine-tune his imaging technology on Titanic's identical twin, Britannic, which sank two years after Titanic during World War I. Sonar image quality largely depends on how close the fish can get to the wreck. As the fish passes over the site, it sends out an acoustic signal. The signal rebounds off the ship, and the software creates an image. In a matter of hours, Britannic is revealed lying on her side on the ocean bottom. Next, Matthias validates what he saw in his ghostly images with an eyewitness inspection of Britannic. By fine-tuning his software here in the shallow seas, he increases his chances of capturing an image of Titanic in extremely deep waters. Matthias confirms much of what his sonar imaged. The railings on the bow. The promenade deck. The great hole caused by her sinking during the First World War. and even her massive propeller. Matthias leaves Greece with high hopes for Titanic. Compared to the warm waters of the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic is deep and dangerous. The weather here is now turning for the worst. There's no guarantee that Matthias will succeed in this inhospitable environment. On his way to Titanic, Matthias prepares his imaging software. Thirty feet above the wreck, the team begins scanning the area in a process called mowing the lawn. What we're doing now is we're scanning across the seabed in the nautile with a sonar looking out to 600 feet on either side, and we're building up a picture of the seabed. A routine survey has never been done in the area. This is the first tape of uh, side scan data over the Titanic taken by a submarine. We've also collected the data on uh, optical disk on the computer. That one's at 2347. Matthias and Durzenko now begin to plot out the first archaeological map of the Titanic wreck site. Wow, look at that. Look at that. That's gotta be it. That's the bow. 